Hi guys, so welcome back to Junis Vlog of the Graph. For today's video reaction, let's go to our favorite country which is Russia. Private and spasiba to our Russian friends. How are you all guys? If you're doing well and amazing. And the title, uh, this is a video request reaction by Anna Lebedeva. Thank you so much Anna Lebedeva for suggesting with this amazing historical video that we really want to discover and what is the true story behind of this war before. And this video, 15 parts of this one. The title of this video is Turn Out Patriotic Part 1. Hitler and his humble co friends and credit to the owner also with the video to Ministry of Defense Russia. I'll put in the description box below so that you can connect also with the owner of the video. And if you're new to my channel, just click the subscribe button, click the notification bell so that you'll be updated on our future uploads. And if you have some comments and suggestions related to this video or any Russian video or Russian history that you can suggest, please drop it in the section below to read and respond you all and make your video requests. I'm so excited to know with this story guys because i know how hard the red army or uh, soviet army fought during this world war ii and there are like other story that sharing with this one even in our school this this hasn't like a uh, thought or this hasn't like a teach in our in our school so i really want to know more the story of this amazing uh, historical video like hitler and his humble co friends and you know how did Hitler during this war? And I really want to hear also with you at the comment section what are your thoughts with regards to this video because I'm so excited to learn more about this because since we are like uh, knowing the history, this is like discovering more or story or there are like uh, there are articles saying this and there are articles saying that there there is something like uh, you can learn more about it because there are no exact fact that they are saying or we know and i hope this video will tell us more about it and i would love to listen with you at the comment section additional information with regards to this part one of eternal patriotic and i'll give you some little information before we will start since this is our first video reaction on this amazing uh, victory victory war of the red army the Russian Defense Ministry on the eve of the victory day publishes the documentary series of the Eternal Patriotic. Viewers of serial documentary film learn about the most important events of the Great Patriotic War from video chronicle and historical documents of the Russian military archive, memoirs of participants in significant events and the battles. Famous actors Andrei Marzelikin and Sergei per Pushki Palace will tell about the true plans of Nazi Germany and its allies, the most important battles and heroism and courage of Red Army servicemen, the fate of the Marshal of Victory and much more. My God, I'm truly excited to watch and listen with this amazing video because I really want to know more about what truly happens during this world war. Knowing this is like uh, getting you more knowledge about what really happens on those times and i'm so excited and if you have some additional information or there are parts that you disagree on the video just let me know also so that i can know and understand more and there are a lot of people i know that they have different like ideas and different thoughts about with regards to this one and i appreciate if you can write it in the comment section and kudos to the owner of the video also thank you so much anna levideva for suggesting with this one let's get to it enjoy guys and private and spasi battle wow. Much love and respect from here in the Philippines. Do or die to burn the handle or both ends. Our boss is We will prevail. We truly know how hard uh, during this war the Red Army fought. Сегодня нам часто 
что Советский Союз, как никакая другая страна, вложился в экономическую мощь фашистской Германии, придав тем самым ценности европейской демократии и подготовив войну. Говорят, к примеру, что в тайных школах Советского Союза обучались нужные для грядущей войны кадры. Такие школы действительно существовали. Например, в Липецке где наряду с советскими пилотами с 1925 года по 1933 немецкие инструкторы за немецкий счет подготовили 220 немецких летчиков. Для сравнения, в нелегальных школах самой Германии около 2000 летчиков. Но на секундочку, это все-таки было до прихода Гитлера ко власти. А в 1933 году военное сотрудничество СССР и Германии было свернуто, школы закрыты, а торговый оборот сократился по сравнению с 1932 годом вдвое. А в 1937 году в пять раз. А вот у западных демократий все было как раз наоборот. Was brought to the Berlin Zoo. Eloquence. Who does to be videographer of this one? I really like it. When Hitler it... seized power on January 30th, 1933, he ruled a country with a foreign debt of nearly 19 million marks, of which 1.7 million were owed to Great Britain. Yet already on February 17th of the same year, Germany's major creditors signed an agreement that they would not demand payment. Oh. A year later, this agreement was extended. On June 14, 1934, Germany's National Bank announced it would no longer pay any foreign debts or the interest on them. Oh. Instead of money, Germany's creditors received bonds that promised a 3% return over 10 years. The London Stock Exchange Gazette on May 3rd, 1935 tells us, time and time again, Germany has defaulted on her obligations, public and private. But she has gone on buying wool, cotton, nickel, rubber, and petrol until her requirements were fulfilled. And the financing has been done directly or indirectly through London. Why were the British being so indulgent? Perhaps they had There's just something. got the German Chancellor they wanted? Yeah. There's something behind it. Because it, it doesn't happen to be like you have to go in the process. Let us open Mein Kampf and read what the future Führer of Germany wrote during his jail sentence after the unsuccessful putsch of November 1923. If land was desired in Europe, it could be obtained only at the expense of Russia by the German sword sawed for the German plow and daily bread for the nation. For such a policy, there was but one ally in Europe, England. With England alone, was it possible, our rear protected, to begin the new Germanic march? This is interesting, I love it. It's Hitler just like had I just need as many reasons now. to appreciate the United States. By the early 1930s, over 60 American corporations had branches in Germany. And under Hitler, the numbers grew further still. Western businesses actively aided the Third Reich in setting up military manufacturing. The designers of the Messerschmitt 109 fighter planes and the Junker 87 dive bombers could not test their creations out for lack of engines. Here, the British came to the rescue by selling Rolls-Royce guest airplane engines. Wow. Without the British, Germany's war manufacturing might have started much later, and so Germany would not have had the, the necessary Germans material for launching war. World War II. 
Hitler's regime was given favored nation status also in foreign policy. On January 13, 1935, Britain and France did not intervene when a referendum was held in Saarland. The Führer carried out a bold agitprop campaign and won for himself a region rich in coal. Oh. On March 18, 1935, Hitler unilaterally withdrew from the Versailles Treaty established at the end of World War I, which had limited the size of Germany's army. The reaction from London and Paris was apathetic because they knew Hitler and were sure that the dictator was arming Germany for an attack on the East. Oh, this guy knows already. France and the British. On June 18, 1935, a naval treaty was signed between Germany and the UK, according to which Germany could boast 35% the number of warships as Britain and 100% the number of submarines. But it truly planned On March 7, 1936, Germany moved military forces into the Rhineland, which had been made a demilitarized zone after World War I. London and Paris again reacted only weakly. As Hitler recalled, the 48 hours following the entry into the Rhineland were the most nerve-wracking of my life. Had the French charged into the Rhineland, we would have had to pull back. The military strength, which we possessed, could have in no way mounted even a moderate resistance. Yeah. Because he planned already. On March 13, 1938, Hitler annexed Austria. On November 12, 1918, the Austrian National Assembly had recognized the country as an integral part of Germany. And on March 2nd of the following year, 1919, the governments of both nations signed a preliminary statement in Berlin on the creation of a single state. The subsequent Entente had categorically ruled out any unification, but now Hitler was allowed to send troops into Austria and organize a referendum under Nazi control. Mm -hmm. On September 30th, 1938, Britain and France signed the Munich Agreement with Hitler, which allowed the German dictator to seize that part of Czechoslovakian territory with a German population and ultimately all of the Czech lands. Recall how this all happened, because today we in Russia are blamed for all this. Oh. Sorry to hear. The negotiations in Munich included only Germany, Italy, the UK, and France. Czechoslovakia's so representatives Wojciech Mostny and Hubert Masaryk were shut out and only informed later. They were then given an ultimatum that if Prague did not accept the annexation, it would have to deal with the Germans all on its own. Oh my God. Of the 14.8 million citizens of Czechoslovakia, the Germans amounted to 3.5 million. There were over 3 million Slovaks, and the Hungarian, Rusin, Polish, and Jewish minorities added up to over a million more people. Most Germans, Hungarians, and Poles did not want to fight against their ethnic kin. Right. Faced with such a situation, the Czechs had no way to defend themselves. After Britain and France signed the Munich Agreement with Germany, the Czechs capitulated. This is so much so interesting. Oh my God. I can feel Germany like seized the shields and, and German with this tanks one. stopped just 30 kilometers from Prague. Hungary took Slovakia's southern regions and Poland took the south of Sieszyn Silesia. Hitler guaranteed that the rest of Czechoslovakia would be left alone, but he soon provoked the separation of the Czech lands and Slovakia and thus had a pretext for breaking his promise. And so on March 14, 1939, the Czech lands were made part of Germany and referred to as the Bohemia and Moravia Protectorate. Hungary took Transcarpathia and the Slovak rump state became merely a Nazi puppet. By late 1938, the metallurgical industries in Sieszyn Silesia were producing 41% of Poland's cast iron and nearly 47% of its steel. Wow. 
So he used the Germans it. were not the only vultures feasting on dead Czechoslovakia. Oh my God. Right after the Munich Agreement, the Polish government demanded that the Sieschen border region be handed over to it. Those heroic traits which the Polish people possess should not make us turn a blind eye to this nation's recklessness and ingratitude, which for centuries have caused it immeasurable suffering. That's In 1919, sad. the Allies' victory had finally turned Poland, after many generations of thraldom, into an independent republic. But after the partition of Czechoslovakia, England and France were all too happy to push Hitler toward the east, and then they sought to undermine talks between Germany and Russia on Poland so that the Nazis would not conclude a treaty with the USSR. Yet today, the vast majority of Polish political commentators tell, with great fervor, a totally different story about how Hitler and Stalin mistreated their fine and upstanding nation. Western democracies nod favorably at this, though they, of course, know how it was. Oh my God. And this is how it was. I'm, According to I the Treaty of Versailles, sad. the German port of Danzig was separated from Germany and turned into a free city under the League of Nations. Danzig was in a customs union with Poland and could only maintain its international ties through Warsaw. Hitler demanded that Danzig be handed back to the Third Reich and that highways and railways be built to connect Eastern Prussia with mainland Germany through the so-called Polish Corridor. The Poles were openly seeking friendship with Hitler and hoped that with his help, they could seize not only Czechoslovakian territory, but also parts of the Soviet Union. However, they were loath to surrender Danzig, though it wasn't theirs anyway. Therefore, on March 26, 1939, Poland refused to accede to German demands, expecting that Britain and France would come to its aid. On March 31st, the British indeed promised such help. In turn, Germany withdrew from the Anglo-German Naval Treaty and its policy of non-aggression against Poland. The USSR's chief diplomat, Maxim Litvinov, had already suggested on March 18th that a conference draw together the Soviet Union, Britain, France, Romania, Poland, and Turkey with the aim of forestalling German aggression. However, London did not want to commit to any obligations. Foreign Secretary Edward Halifax asked Moscow if it would oh accept a unilateral God. declaration of assistance, that is, whether it would be prepared to take on Germany for Poland and Romania's sake, while London and Paris stood on the sidelines. Halifax declined the Soviet Union's proposal that he travel to Moscow for negotiations. He truly manipulated this people. As Churchill claimed, but here is an offer, a fair offer, and a better offer, in my opinion, than the terms which the government seek to get for themselves, a more simple, a oh more my. direct, and a more effective offer. Churchill was in this a visionary who foretold the whole picture of the next several years. Just listen to him. Only on August 12th did negotiations finally begin in Moscow on a possible military treaty. The Soviet Union was represented by Klement Voroshilov, the top man in the army. Wow. By comparison, the French delegation was led by General Joseph Dumaine, a mere regional commander. Britain was represented by Admiral Reginald Drax, who was the commander-in-chief of Plymouth. Neither the British nor the French sent anyone authorized to sign an agreement. Correct. The USSR offered some clear proposals, but these met with no interest from London and Paris. Oh my God. Admiral See. Drax had, in fact, been given instructions that under no circumstances did the British government wish to make any specific commitments that would bind their hands. Meanwhile, the Poles categorically refused to even consider letting the Red Army cross their territory. The Polish commander-in-chief, Edward Rydz Smigli, declared on August 19th, Regardless of the consequences, we will not allow Russian troops to ever occupy a single inch of Polish territory. 
Under these circumstances, any further negotiations oh. were senseless. And so the USSR moved to conclude instead a non-aggression pact with Germany. We had no other choice. These fight. vaunted Western democracies and self-spiting Poland left us no choice at all. Oh my goodness. Very, very clear. When Germany attacked Poland on September 1st, 1939, the Polish leadership quickly ran for their lives. Of course, At because 3 15 a.m. during September the September 17th, 1939, ready. the Soviet government handed Václav Grzebowski, the ambassador to the USSR, a note. The Polish government has collapsed and shows no signs of life. This means that the Polish state and its government have ceased to exist. Therefore, the treaties sad. concluded between the USSR and Poland have been terminated. Left to its own devices and without leadership, Poland has become a convenient field for all sorts of accidents and surprises that could threaten the Soviet Union. The Soviet government, hitherto neutral, can no longer remain indifferent to the fact that Ukrainian and Belarusian kin living in Poland are left to fend for themselves, left defenseless. In view of this situation, the Soviet government has instructed the Red Army to order troops to cross the border and take under their protection the lives and property of the population of Western Ukraine and Western Belarus. Wasn't this how things really happened? Obviously, yes. Stalin was supposed to just let Germany grab the whole of Poland, but instead, he did a bad thing. A really bad thing. The only bad thing Stalin did was moving the borders farther from Moscow, but this proved vital later. It's quite possible that this decision saved both us and the Poles whom we liberated, and everyone today who speaks of Soviet occupiers. They would hardly be able to wax so eloquently if we had not entered the Western territories of the Ukraine and Belarus, which then belonged to Poland. See? Finally, it is important to note that when the Polish commander-in-chief, Edward Rydz Smigli, gave orders to his troops, he did not take the arrival of Red Army troops as a declaration of war, and he told his forces not to fight the Soviets. Moreover, Man. the League of Nations did not declare the USSR an aggressor state, and Churchill once again proved the most reasonable person, and he acknowledged though with reservations, the correctness of the USSR's position. He said, Russia has pursued a cold policy of self-interest. We could have wished that the Russian armies should be standing on their present line as the friends and allies of Poland instead of as invaders, but that the Russian armies should stand on this line was clearly necessary for the safety of Russia against the Nazi menace. Today, wow. commentators speak of these times as if they occurred in a vacuum with merely two players, Stalin and Hitler, and others played hardly any role. In fact, others nearly refused to play a role. Very clear. What was the French army, considered Europe's strongest, doing as the Germans invaded Poland? The French began mobilization on August 21st, and by the end of September, they had 82 divisions reinforced by 50 tank battalions and numerous heavy artillery, including 400 and 520 millimeter railway guns. They were opposed by 43 German divisions with much weaker artillery, without a single tank and a very limited amount of ammunition. Oh my God. 82 divisions against 43. Yes, from September 7th to the 12th, the French did take 12 border villages in the Saarland, but then they abandoned them without even reaching the Germans' main positions. In these battles, around 1,000 men died on both sides. Oh my. Then the fighting stopped entirely and the so-called phony war set in. The French command worried that their soldiers would grow bored and restless, and so they ordered that footballs be delivered to them. 
Churchill looked back on the French army's failure to launch an attack on Germany. After completing their mobilization, he said, they remained inactive along the entire front. The French government even asked Britain not to attack Germany by air, as this could lead to reprisals against French military enterprises. The British limited themselves to dropping leaflets, which appealed to Germany's sense of morality. This strange stage of the war on the ground and in the skies astonished everyone. France and what Britain took no action for weeks as the German war machine devastated and subjugated Poland. Oh the war in the skies can the be traced Polish. from the account of British bomber ace Guy Gibson. Gibson's Lancaster bomber took off for the first time to fight the Germans on the same day war was declared, but after it came under Nazi fire, it dropped all its bombs into the water. Then a long break of seven and a half months followed. Only on April 19, 1940, did Gibson get to fly again. British planes mainly attacked coastal points or small towns that were nearly undefended. No one raised their voices in favor of attacking the Third Reich's military bases, and the idea of bombing German industrial targets seemed Very utter right. blasphemy. When Leo Emery, British Secretary of State for Indian Affairs, suggested to Minister of Aviation Kingsley Wood that Britain drop a few incendiary bombs on the Black Forest as the Germans were using its timber for military purposes, the Minister of Aviation furiously refused claiming that such sites were private property and bombing them would alienate American public opinion. Considering that many German factories belonged specifically to Americans like Rockefeller and Ford, the concerns were clear, and this is why the leaflets Churchill mentioned had to be dropped instead. Marshal of the Royal Air Force Arthur Harris wrote, My personal view is that the only thing we achieved was largely to supply the continent's requirements of toilet paper for the five long years of the war. One more contribution by European democracies to the building of fascism. And we are hardly joking, for jokes would be inappropriate right. when we know how all this ended. But it also doesn't hurt to know how it all began. It began with European democracies lending solid support to Nazi Germany in its economic development. Then, when the time came to make war on Germany, European democracies did this very badly. If, at any of these stages, they had just engaged with the USSR, then the most terrible war in humankind's history and the Holocaust would never have happened. Correct. Right. Nothing would have happened. But it did. In all good conscience, Western democracies should be making amends for their aid to Nazi Germany, or at least their failure to resist it. Meanwhile, it is we who are blamed. We who proved the victors and saviors of humankind. Oh my god. This was the end of part one and I know there are 15 parts of this. And this is truly interesting. I felt a sad and eternal memory to all the people who died during those war, especially to the Polish people that the Nazis attacked with it. And there are things that like I could not understand why the French didn't like attack that they have the chance to win that war and like they know already or I think they know already the Nazis attack already Polish and killed many people in that time and they have the chance to like to stop this war oh my god and I think some of those 
people, some of the higher uh, possession was manipulated by Hitler. And imagine of other countries what they are doing nothing to go against with what whatever uh, the Germans are are planning during those times. And I felt so bad and sad about it because truly the narrator saying that it's truly us it's to be blamed not the like not, not the nazis or not the germans because these people there are a lot of like the british the france and the other nations that can help that that they know already that these things are happening but they are not like doing anything because i think something has stopping with them to stop with the germans of what they are doing they know oh my god i felt bad and sad of what truly really happens in this time and of course the red army they cannot do anything about it because of course somebody stopping with them it's truly interesting and i really want to know more the deep or the detail of this one as we go through on the part to our next video reaction and guys, if you have additional uh, comments or thoughts or if you disagree some parts of this video, please write it in the comment section. I would love to listen with you and hear with you also so that I could understand more on this part one of Hitler and his humble co-friends. And I hope guys you enjoyed watching with this one. And if you do and if you really want to see the full video and connect with the owner of the video, I'll put it in the description box below. If you like this video guys, same as I did, just give a massive thumbs up. Like and just subscribe also to my channel. This is Junris Blagadag React saying Istanbul so positive guys. If you want to connect my social media account, is in here. If you want to connect my second channel, it's in the description box below. Thank you so much for that and spasiba to our Russian friends. Have a good day everyone. Bye-bye. Mabuhay po tayong lahat. God bless po and see you in my next video react.